1,500 years before Jesus was born, before God became a man in the form of Jesus, about 1,500 years before that, God called Moses to go prepare and, and, and take his people out of Egypt. Moses was a reluctant servant. Moses didn't want to do it. Uh, God did, appeared to him in the burning bush. For those of you who maybe aren't Bible readers, you've heard about the burning bush. That's, that's what it was. Moses, uh, God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, and, and, and God said to Moses, go take my people out of Egypt. Moses had, had spent his life in Egypt, had, had run away from that, was a shepherd, was living his life just taking care of sheep. And now God was calling him to go back to Egypt and rescue the nation of Israel out of slavery to rescue the people of God. And, and Moses was reluctant. He didn't want to do it. He said, no way, God, I can't do that. He made lots of excuses. He said, there's no way. And God said, yep, that's what you're going to do. And so that's what Moses did. And, and Moses went to Pharaoh and Moses said, let my people go. And it sounded like that. And I know it sounded like that because I watched the movie. And so that has to be true. So it happened. So, so Moses went and said, let my people go. And, and, and Pharaoh was like, no way. Absolutely not. I am absolutely not going to let your people go. And they're my people. They're my slaves. They're doing what I want them to do. That's not going to happen at all. And, and, and so, so Moses said, God said, there's going to be some plagues. And, and there were 10 plagues. And every time there was a, a plague, after the plague would happen, Moses would go to Pharaoh and said, see, I told you, God's going to keep doing this if you don't let my people go. And Moses or Pharaoh would say, no, absolutely not, every time. And there were water turned to blood, there was darkness, there was locusts, there was uh, frogs. There were all of these plagues, and they all culminated into, into this one big thing that ended the, the whole the plague of all plagues, which was the death of the firstborn. Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, listen, God has told me, if you don't do what, what God wants you to do, if you don't let my, God's people go, then, then the plague of death of the firstborn is going to happen to every person in Egypt. From you, Pharaoh, to every person that's, that's in your cabinet, every person that lives in your, uh, your, your, your palace here, every person that you know, every person that you don't know, even to the lowliest slave in, in all of Egypt, uh, the, the livestock, everything, the firstborn is going to die if you don't do what God says to do. And Pharaoh says, I am not going to do it. And so, and so Moses went back to the people of, of, of Israel and the Hebrew people, and he said, listen, this is what's going to happen. And if we don't prepare ourselves, if we don't get ready, make ready, then, then, the, then God's going to come and he's going to kill our firstborn too. So here's what you have to do. He told them what God told him, which is basically to take a lamb, a spotless lamb, uh, put blood on the doorpost. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Maybe most of you maybe have. You put blood on the doorpost and, and, and God is going to pass by. He's going to pass over every house that has blood on the doorpost that is covered by the blood of a lamb. And so that's exactly what happened because the Hebrews put blood on their doorposts. God passed over them, allowing the firstborn of their families to live. But the, the families of everyone else who did not put blood on the doorpost, God killed the firstborn. And so Moses went to, to Pharaoh and Pharaoh relented and let the people go. And so from that time forward, from, from that night, the very first time uh, up until even today, uh, Jewish people celebrate what's called Passover. And it's commemorating, it's remembering what happened on that day, on that night, where, where God went through the people, all the people of Egypt, and passed over, sparing the firstborn son of, of every person that had uh, blood on the door, doorpost. And so they were celebrating, the Jews celebrated even to today. And, and today we're going to look at where, where the, the disciples and Jesus were making preparations to celebrate Jesus' last Passover. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, we're going to be reading here about Jesus' last Passover, starting in verse 12. Uh, the disciples, they didn't know that this was going to be Jesus' last Passover, of course. They were just making preparations for them. It was just... It was just Passover, right? It was just another Passover. They celebrated Passover every single year, and so they were making preparations uh, for Passover. They didn't know that this was the last Passover that Jesus was ever going to celebrate. So let's begin by reading here Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 12. And on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Basically, they're asking Jesus, where do, you, where do you want to eat Passover? Where do you want to celebrate Passover? Jesus, if you remember, Jesus doesn't have a place to lay his head. Jesus is kind of homeless, so most people would celebrate Passover in their house. Jesus didn't have a house, so he had to figure out where we're going to go celebrate Passover. And Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. 
follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? And, and where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, there prepare for us. And the disciples set out, and they went into the city, and they found it just as he told them, and there they prepared the Passover. And so the disciples knew that they, they were in Jerusalem for this very reason. They had people from all over would, would come back to Jerusalem to prepare and, and, and celebrate the Passover. And so they asked Jesus, you know, well, you know where are we going to go? Where are we going to have the Passover? How is this going to work out? And, and, and Jesus gives them some, some really strangely specific answers to their question about where do you want us to go to prepare? Where, who do you want us to go ask or where do you want us to go and do? Uh, Jesus told them that you go, you find a man who's carrying water. They had to go make all kinds of preparations. They had to make sure that they had the bitter herbs. They had to make sure they had the bread. They had to make sure they had the wine. And, and, and they found everything just like Jesus said. They went in town and they, they found a guy carrying water, which to us doesn't, doesn't matter. Maybe you think about like, like somebody carrying water like this, or, or maybe you even think about a guy carrying a jug of water, right? But that doesn't, doesn't matter to us. But to them, this is a big deal because... Again, this is not Jonathan saying, this is just history. In, in their culture, that was what the women did. The men didn't carry water, they were above that, I guess. And so the women were carrying water. And so they would say, Jesus said, you're going to find a guy, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb because he's carrying water. And, and they found it just as Jesus said, it was just as they expected and the Passover meal, as they're preparing for that, and as they do Passover today, Passover meals uh, always have somebody presiding over the Passover meal. And in this case, it was Jesus, the one that was presiding over the meal. So Jesus was ready to do that. And the one presiding over the Passover meal would, would tell the people there uh, celebrating Passover with them about all the things that happened. There is a very distinct order of events, the way Passover meals are celebrated. They do this in a, in a certain way. One thing leads to another. And all of this is a culmination of, of a remembrance of what happened way back when Moses uh, was leading the charge to have the people of Israel leave Egypt. And it happened the same way every single year until this one. Look at look, Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 17. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who's dipping his bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes at his, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Now for them, this is incredibly strange. This is weird. This is out of place. This doesn't make sense to them. They had celebrated Passover every single year of their lives, and now they know how Passover goes. They don't even have to think about it. They know what's going to happen. They know what is the right thing to say, when the right time to say it. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus throws this in. Someone is going to be trained. It's off script. Things are happening in a way there weren't expecting and, and and now these men are are, are are thinking that this is this is strange what's Jesus talking about not only is it is it strange what he said but where he said it and when he said it is is incredibly strange why is Jesus saying that this would be like dropping a bombshell on your Thanksgiving dinner. You got your family over, right? You do the same thing every year. You've got the turkey, you've got, you've got the dressing, you've got the ham, you've got the green beans, you've got everything the way it's going to be. And, and your cousin comes in and he says, hey, I brought the pot roast. That doesn't make sense. You're like, wait a minute. No, that pot roast doesn't happen at Thanksgiving. Or it's like, or it's like you're sitting around at Thanksgiving dinner. Maybe some of you have the tradition where, where you go around and everybody says what they were thankful for that year. My dad used to make us do that, which I thought, man, this is so hard. I hated that. Uh, maybe you have that tradition and all of a sudden the, the, the grandson says, I'm joining the circus. You know, it's like dropping a bombshell in the middle of Thanksgiving. This is what's happening here in this last Passover. Jesus' last Passover, there's this, this bombshell that drops. Not only are they, are they off script, not only are they doing things that they weren't expecting to happen, but Jesus says, one of them is going to betray me. One of the closest friends, one of the 12 there with Jesus, and they're shocked. They can't imagine. But then they start doing a little personal reflection and they think, maybe Jesus knows something about me. Could it be me? 
I mean, if Jesus were in this room and he would say to us, one of you in this room will betray me, our first thoughts would go to, to, to him or to her. Or we think, yeah. But then when we start to think, we think, wait a minute. I, I know me. I know my heart. I know my tendency to turn my back on Jesus. And, and so maybe us, would, we would be like them, and we would begin asking the question, Jesus, is it, is it I? Could it be me? Am I the one that's going to betray you? And imagine going down the line, right? Jesus is there with the 12, and I just kind of picture this in my mind, and one after the other begins asking him, is it, is it I? Expecting Jesus to say no, hoping that Jesus is going to say no when they ask the question, is it I? Hoping that Jesus would say, no, 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 not, not you. And then they get to Judas. And Judas knows his heart. Judas knows what's happened. Jesus, Judas knows what's going on. And Judas, to cover his tracks, I think, Judas asked the question of Jesus that they were asking, is it, is it I? For those of you who don't know, maybe look back. We didn't mention it last week uh, and kind of started after it today. Look back at verses 10 and 11 there, in, in, or 10, yeah, 10 and 11 there in verse chapter 14. Uh, this was before the Passover meal. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him and to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and they promised to give him money, and he sought the opportunity to betray him. Last week we talked about the chief priest wanting to put Jesus to death, and Judas was making a way for that to happen. And so in this Passover, when Judas says, is it I, he knows in his heart what's already happened, that Judas has betrayed Jesus. And there's this thick, heavy tension in the room. Just imagine being there, wondering what's going on. How could this be? How could this happen? If we were there, we could feel it. Maybe you can even feel it right now. This heavy tension in the air, and Jesus lets the rest of them in on it. It's the one who dipped his bread in the dish with me. In John's Gospel, John says that, that Jesus said, it's the one that I, that I dipped my bread in and handed it to Judas. And Judas, in that moment, leaves the room destined to culminate his betrayal of Jesus, to show his true loyalty wasn't to Christ at all. His true loyalty was, was to himself and the money that he worshipped. And Jesus' last Passover meal wasn't a normal meal of celebration. It wasn't a normal meal of remembrance. It was a meal of betrayal pointing to his death. But the disciples in that room with Jesus were still largely in the dark. They didn't, they didn't know what exactly was about to take place. They didn't understand what they were seeing. I imagine some of them didn't even understand why Judas had left the room. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew they were confused, and so he still went through this, this second change in liturgy. Most of you don't use that word or maybe not even know what that word is. Liturgy is just simply a, a way in which we do worship. Most churches uh, have, have liturgy in their service. Our service has a, has a liturgy to it. You, you heard Roy in his prayer say that we have a, a change in our service today. We changed up our, our liturgy. We, we, we usually take a, a lower value. We, have a lower, uh, we place lower weight on, on how our service goes. Some churches are, are very liturgical where everything has its place and has its order and, and the way it was going and how it's supposed to go. And, and the Passover meal was like that. The Passover meal was, it was very distinct in order and process. And, and here Jesus changes it again. He had just changed it a minute ago by saying that one of you in this room is going to betray me. And now he changes this, this liturgy for the Passover again. Look at verse 22. And it says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after breaking it, he gave it to them and he said, take, this is my body. And I imagine their thoughts going, wait, what? I've never heard this in a Passover before. This doesn't make sense. Jesus, why are you adding something to our Passover script? Take, this is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank of it. And he said to them about the cup. He says, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And so this meal that has been celebrated for millennia uh, among the Jewish people and, 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 and had been celebrated for the entire lives of the disciples, it, Jesus is changing it. And they didn't realize, they didn't understand what's going on. 
They didn't understand that every meal, every Passover that they'd been to, every Passover that happened uh, before they were even born, every Passover before this one was pointing to this moment. Every Passover lamb that was slain was pointing to Jesus. In this way, in this moment, Jesus is changing the very meaning of the Passover meal. It was no longer about the blood of any lamb that they chose to cover their family. It was now about the blood of the Lamb of God. It was about the blood of the one, the Lamb who would take away the sin of the world. Jesus used that that title Uh, Lamb of God, when he was describing Jesus just before he baptized him, John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God. Jesus is that spotless Lamb that all other lambs before him pointed to. All those lambs who were sacrificed at all those Passover meal, all those years before were pointing to Jesus, the sacrificial Lamb of God who would come to earth to take away the sins of the world forever. Not until next year when we do it again, but forever. And it's the blood of Jesus poured out and metaphorically painted on our own personal doorpost that covers us from the wrath of God. And it's in this moment here in Jesus' last Passover when Jesus announces the basis for relationship with God is, is no longer the blood of a lamb, but the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ Himself. In this moment, Jesus announces the change in this covenant relationship, going from from that old covenant relationship to this new covenant relationship between God and man, the old one being sacrifice, the new one being Jesus giving his life. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 and 7 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened his mouth not he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah wrote this about seven hundred years before Jesus became that lamb. Before Jesus was sitting at this Passover table with, with his disciples, about to start a revolution that would change the world forever. I thought about that this week as I, as I saw the stories of the, the massacre that happened in Christchurch, New Zealand. Terrible, horrific tragedy, of evil act of terrorism. But one of the things that is awful, and, and that, all of that stuff is awful, but my mind went to the name of the town, Christchurch, New Zealand. The revolution that started here at this Passover and culminated in the death and resurrection of Jesus and the start of the church didn't stay there. We're worshiping here this morning because Jesus started a revolution, because Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God that died to save us all. There's a a town in New Zealand named after Jesus. Why? Because Jesus started a revolution that would impact and change the world. The New Covenant. The promise of God is for all humanity. And that's what God had been planning all along that no one could see coming except Christ. Jesus was God himself in the flesh that he would give himself as the perfect and complete forever spotless sacrifice of our sins that we needed. Moses led the Jews to take refuge under the blood of a spotless lamb. And now today we take refuge in the blood of Christ Jesus the spotless Lamb of God. On the cross, Jesus got what we deserve. Jesus got the punishment that I deserve. My sin separating me from God. But on the cross, Jesus got not only my sin, but the sin of all humanity, Uh, the brokenness of the world falling on the shoulders of Jesus. Even the, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus in that moment, pouring out on Him instead of us. In that moment, His blood was poured on our doorpost so that we could be forever passed over. All who put their faith and trust in Him now have the blood of Christ covering them. But it didn't end that day. It didn't end there, that last Passover for Jesus. This meal is something that that was to continue, and today we call it the Lord's Supper. In Luke's Gospel, Luke mentions something that Mark doesn't mention here. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19 
It says, and he took the bread, talking about Jesus, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. And he says something that Mark doesn't mention. Do this in remembrance of me. No longer would this meal point back to the Passover of Moses in Egypt. Now this meal is a remembrance of of the spotless Lamb of God dying on our behalf. That last sentence there in in, in Luke is is important. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus instituted this ongoing commemoration. No longer would, would Passover be only about what God did in Egypt. Now it was pointing to something else, something bigger, something that it had been pointing to all along. In Egypt and after Egypt, they were to participate this this meal, this meal, to participate in this meal, it had to be eaten. The, the lamb had to be consumed. There had to be uh, some type of, of partaking of this meal to be a participate, participant in this, this Passover meal. And in the same way, today as Christians, those of us who are covered by the blood of Christ, we partake in the death of Christ. We participate in the death of Christ by eating His body, represented by the crackers. It sounds kind of crazy. And if you're not a Christian here today, you think, see, I told you, you're, you're like wanting, wanting to know why your wife brought you here. I told you they were crazy. He's talking about easing Jesus. Um, you know, we're, we're, we eat the crackers as a representation, a reminder of His broken body on that cross. And in the Passover, a Jewish family would gather and participate together, remembering what God had done for them, saving them from Egypt and saving from slavery. Christians, today and all over the world, today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we gather with our new family. We gather with our new brothers and sisters in Christ, celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross. For those who aren't Christians, I said it, but for those who aren't Christians, it sounds weird. Not only are we, are we partaking in eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ symbolically with the crackers and, and the juice, but we, now I'm saying we're eating it with our family, and, and, and though our families are here, our, we have a spiritual family, there's a spiritual connection between, between us and those who are also Christians. And Again, all of that sounds weird, right? But we are a family. Not by birth. I have a birth Uh, 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 somebody who's my sibling, a brother by birth. We have the same mom and dad. He lives in Virginia Beach. We we understand that kind of family, right? But we have a new family. By our common faith in Christ, we have a, a new family on the basis of all of us having been saved by Christ. We have a new family because the blood of Christ covers us. Through his death on the cross and rising from the dead, we're, we're covered in his blood and now we are a new family. And so together... We celebrate, we remember the Lord's Supper, remembering what He did. We, we, we do this weekly with our family. Not only here in this place, but it happens all over the globe as, as we together gather around the table with other Christians to remember the Lamb of God. To remember this new covenant promise that God gave us that we will be forever covered by the blood of Christ. And, and I said it, but we, we do it here every single week. Some, some of you, that may seem strange, but we do it every single week because that's what they did uh, in the first century. They had communion whenever they gathered. It was a, a constant reminder for them of the, of the change in covenants, that now we are no longer under this old system, but now we're under this new system with Christ covering us. And, and, and it's a reminder for us as well. Paul gets specific with the church in Corinth about this practice. They had some issues, they had some struggles, they had some concerns about what had happened and what was going on. Paul wrote to them, uh, and it's a good reminder for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, Let me turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, says this. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks 
Sorry, that's like, what is that? For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks with judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And about other things, I will, will give you directions when I come. And Paul writes this because they were struggling with this idea of communion. They were struggling with this, this, this time together where they, where they commemorate and they remember and they're united as a family. They were, they, were, they were struggling. He was emphasizing for them, but it's important for us to remember too. This is a, a very serious time of worship. Just as the Passover was for, for Jews, just as the Passover meal was not is the, a serious time of worship, the, the communion is a serious time of worship for us. When we gather together, we participate in communion together. We are participating, partaking in the body and the blood of Jesus. We're partaking in His death, remembering Him, remembering that it's by His blood that we're saved. It's a reminder not only of, of what He did, but... But, but it's a reminder that we could have never saved ourselves. Just as the Hebrews, they weren't saved unless they painted that, that, that blood of the Lamb on the doorpost. And they would have died had they not. The same is true with us. We cannot be saved apart from the blood of Christ covering us. And so this is a serious time of worship. It's a time of, of reflection. It's a time of remembering. But it's, but it's also a time of looking forward, as Paul said there, a, a time of remembering until Christ comes. In a moment, we're going to participate in communion together. In fact, if, you, if you're serving, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, go ahead to the back and, and, be, and be prepared to, to pass that out because we're going to be um, participating together. But, but in communion, we, we're not only... Uh, look backward, we do. We look backward to the Passover lamb. It's a reminder of what Christ did in Egypt. And we look back at Jesus dying on the cross, the ultimate lamb of God, saving us forever. Uh, but in communion, we also look inward. We reflect on who we are, reflecting on kind of like looking in a mirror, saying, am I, the, am I eating this? Am I participating this in a, in a worthy manner? I, had a, I knew a guy who was who wouldn't participate in communion. He was a Christian because, because he thought any kind of guilt in his life, any kind of sin, he had to be worthy to participate. That's not the point. Paul's saying, are you doing it in a right manner? None of us are worthy of this. But are we doing it in a right manner with our hearts and the minds in the right place? So we, so we look backward at Christ. We look inward at ourselves. We look, we look outward at our brothers and sisters in Christ gathered together, worshiping with us here in this moment. Proclaiming our, our unity to, in Him together. Uh, if, for those, if, we ever, if we have visitors and when we have visitors, this ought to be, communion ought to be a time when they look at us and say, they are one. They're in agreement. So we look, we look backward at the Passover lamb. We look backward at Christ. We look inward like reflecting in a mirror. We look outward at our, at our family in Christ here. But we also look forward. Communion is a time when we, when we glance forward. It's a, it's a longing for His return. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's longing for a day, when, that day, when we, when we drink it anew with Christ in the kingdom of God. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but we, when we gather to, to celebrate communion together, it's a, it's a very small, but it's a very real foretaste of what's going to happen in the kingdom of God when all of God's people gather for that huge, wonderful wedding feast between Christ and the bride in heaven. One day when all of us are saved by Christ, all of His followers, we're all gathered together in, in that feast of unity forever, communing together. The final marriage feast, the final marriage feast, Christ and His bride the church. In fact, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 9, 19, verse 9, we read, And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Today and every week when we gather, we get a foretaste of that final marriage supper, the church and the Lamb of God. So right now we're going to gather for our Feast of Unity. 
We're going to gather for our feast uh, to communing together, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus, reflecting on us, reflecting on ourselves, who we are, uh, looking at our brothers and sisters. You don't have to, to visually look at them, though you can if you want. If somebody looks at you, don't think it's weird. They're, 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 they're connecting with you in unity. Um, they're not looking to see how you do it. It's, it's not what's happening. They're connecting to make sure. Uh, this is, a, this is a, 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 a strictly Christian thing. You're welcome if you're not a Christian. You're welcome to have a piece of cracker and a cup of juice, but it's, but it's really just a cracker and a cup of juice. But as Christians, it's partaking in the death of Jesus. It's remembering that His blood covers us. And in this time, we reflect on our sinfulness. We reflect on His grace. We're going to remember this unity among our family. And we're going to look forward. So that blessed day, that blessed wedding feast, longing for His return that finally brings us together with Him in the kingdom of God forever. So I'm going to pray, and then the, the team's going to pass out communion. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much. What a tremendous blessing. What an honor it is be able to worship in this way, to gather together for our feast of communion, the Lord's Supper, remembering what Christ did for us, dying on the cross, taking the wrath that we deserve because of our sins. God, help us to look inward, to reflect on who we are, where we are. Father, help us to look at our at our brothers and sisters of Christ, in Christ here, not only here in this room, but all over the world, reflecting on the unity that we have in you. And Father, my favorite, help us to look forward to that time when we gather together in that great wedding feast in your kingdom. The magnificent and wonderful and diverse kingdom of God, the church gathering together with Christ at that marriage feast. Thank you, Father, for saving us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus covering us forever. It's in Jesus' name that I pray.